Chapter 21 When Namdaraka expressed further interest in listening to the stories of Sri Narasimha Saraswati, Siddha continued, There was a disciple of Sri Guru by name Tantuka. He used to attend to his worldly duties for three quarters of the day and devote only the remaining part of it for the service of the master. Once all his kinsfolk invited him to join them on a pilgrimage to Holy Sri Salem in Andhra Pradesh. Tantuka replied, the mutt of Sri Guru is as holy to me as Sri Salem, and the Sri Guru is my Lord Marlikarjuna. His kinsfolk considered him a fool and went away on the pilgrimage. Some days later came the holy festival of Shivaratri. On seeing him, Sri Guru said, Why did you not join your people on their holy trip? Tantika replied, There is no holier service than the service of thy feet. Not knowing this, these people rush about to places of pilgrimage in delusion. Lord said, My son, it is not so. Even though the Supreme Lord is all-pervading, His presence can more keenly be realized in the holy places. In those holy places which were sanctified by the austerities of great saints down the ages, the Lord responds to the devotees call more readily. Therefore, people can achieve the goal of their devotions much more easily in such places. Having perfected and liberated themselves, the Mahatmas help others to do so by the power of their austerities. Indeed, the great sages and their divine powers were created only for the uplift of all creatures. Even the dust of the places where they move about is made so holy that can it bless people in their own, in their spiritual endeavors. That is why people go to such holy places on pilgrimage. Now I shall show you such holy places. Then Sri Guru made Tantuka wear his own sandals and commanded him to close his eyes for a while and open them again. The later found that both of them reached Sri Salem in a moment through the yogic power of the master. Then the later told Tantuka to witness the holy place and duly perform all the rituals of the pilgrimage like shaving, bathing and taking darshan of Lord Mallikarjuna, the presiding deity of the place. There his kinsfolk met him and said in astonishment, When we have invited you, you refuse to join us. How then could you be here by the time we reached here? Tantaka told him that it was rendered possible by the grace of Sri Guru, but they could not believe it. When he took darshan of Lord Malikarjuna in the temple, he saw the form of Sri Guru and the Shivalinga there. After finishing his ritual worship, he returned to his master and said, Sir, even in the holy place you alone are present. People do not recognize you for what you are and in their ignorance search for the Lord here and there. You are indeed all-pervading. Sri Guru replied, Indeed the self is all-pervading and yet it manifests itself differently in different places. This holy place is capable of bestowing liberation on the devote. I shall, I shall recount a famous anecdote to illustrate the point. In the land of Kiratas, there was a king named Vimarsana. He was kind-hearted and devoted to the gods and pious Brahmins. Even though he earned the merit of worshipping Lord Shiva in his previous birth, owing to certain misdeeds of that life, he used to eat and drink all those things which were prohibited by Shastras and he left to profligate life. Once his wife asked him, Lord, with all your vices, how could you come to have such deep faith in Lord Shiva? The king replied, In one of my previous lives, I was a dog in the city of Pampa. On a holy Shivaratri, I happened to go to the temple of Shiva. The devotees who assembled there bet me severely and I died then and there. By the merit of dying in the presence of Lord Shiva on such a holy day, I am now born in a royal family. All the beastly traits which you see now in me derive from a previous existence as a dog. Those subtle tendencies in me cannot but manifest themselves. The, then the queen persuaded him to Enlighten her about her own previous life, he said that in that life she was a female pigeon at a holy asylum. As a result of your life long stay at such a holy place, you have now become my queen. Then she asked him, how about the future lives of them both? He said, in the next life I shall be born as a prince of, of the kingdom of Sindhu, and you shall be born in the royal family of the Lord of Sanjaya, and we shall be united in marriage. In the life after that, I shall be the king of Saurashtra and you, born as the princess of Kalinga, shall be my queen. 
In the third birth tenth, I shall be the king of Gandhara, and you as the princess of Magadha will be my queen. In the fourth birth, I shall be the king of Avanti, and you as the princess of Dasarna will be my queen. In the fifth life, I shall be a king named Ananta, and you as the daughter of King Yayati will be my wife. In the sixth life, I shall be the very handsome king of Pandya, and you as the virtuous princess of Vidarbha will marry me. In that life, we will enjoy kingly pleasures and perform many great religious sacrifices. In the seventh birth, we, sh we will attain liberation by the grace of Shri Agastya. In this manner, even animals and birds will attain to higher states of existence. Indeed, it is human beings who, through the force of their earlier evil actions, will be born subsequently as various other creatures in nature. But the gods will ever take care that they do, do not fall away from their heavenly states. Then Sri Guru brought back Tangtuka to the Sangama near Gangapur in as mysterious a way and ordered him to retire to his village. A few people of the village had also joined him and on the way asked him why he got his head shaved. He told him that how Sri Guru took him mysteriously to Sri Salem and how he got his head shaved there as per the custom of the place. They could not believe his words and said, Till a few hours ago, this man was here. He is weaving fairy tales. At night, all of them came to the Sangama, observed fast and kept a vigil till dawn, chanting the name of Lord Shiva. A fortnight later, all the kinsfolk of Tantukar returned from Sri Salem. They wondered when they learned that he was back at Kangapur far, effort, far ahead of them. They realized that it was all of the grace of Sri Guru. The people at Gangapur also confirmed Tantuka's words. Through incessant service of his master, he eventually freed himself from the shackles of his previous karma and attained the highest bliss that transcends the pairs of opposites like joy and sorrow. Who can ever know how many are the souls that were thus liberated through devotion to the Guru? In the same manner, there were two poets who attained liberation by celebrating the divine glory of Sri Narasimha Saraswati in verse. Infinite are the divine acts of the Lord, and no one can ever know them in full. The Vedas themselves have betrayed their inability to comprehend this glory. Namadharaka longed to know the story of two poets in full. So Siddha gladly resumed his account. A Brahmin by name Nandi Sharma was affected by leprosy. In order to free himself of it, he practiced severe austerity, tapasit, Tuljapur. One day, Goddess Bhavani appeared to him in a vision and directed him to worship Goddess Chandaleshwari. Accordingly, he went there and practiced austerities for seven, seven long months. One day, the Goddess appeared in a vision and directed him to serve the sannyasi at Gangapur to realize his object. The Brahmin was shocked and even lost his patience and remonstrated her. Are you, a Goddess, not ashamed to tell me to serve a common mortal? What happened to your divine power? If you could not help me yourself, why have you not told me so even earlier and spared me all my long, strenuous efforts? Without a word, the goddess disappeared. The man again pursued his austerity to win her favor, but it was in vain. At last, finding no other way, one day he went to Gangapur to see the sannyasi, as per the direction of the goddess. Strangely enough, in spite of his repeated inquiries, no one at Gangapur directed him to the Lord. <coughs> At last, an old man told him that the master was due to arrive there for the holy Shivaratri. Meanwhile, some of the local devotees of Sri Guru had conveyed to him the news of the arrival of Nandi Sharma. Immediately, Sri Guru summoned Nandi Sharma and said, Why have you come here to serve a common mortal, leaving aside the many deities? For no mere mortal can ever free you of your fell disease. Nandi Sharma immediately realized the stuff of which sannyasi was made, that he was indeed the Supreme Lord himself. He prayed, Lord, pardon me my error. I am the dull of intellect and a skeptic and a fallen sinner. You, on the other hand, are the ocean of mercy and filial love for your devotees. I seek you, refugee. I have no one else to help me. Soon after my marriage, I was afflicted with this foul disease. Even my parents and wife have left me. Even the gods have refused to respond to my prayers. I find it better to end my life than to prolong such a tale of misery. Although Supreme Self, 
If you take look on me with a cold eye, I shall be compelled to take my life. The merciful Lord was moved at his plight and said, Do not fear, my son. This disease is a result of your previous sins, which can be washed off only through patient endurance. Indeed, you have gained this faith in me now, only because of the results of your evil karma have worked out. Now you take a dip in the holy Sangama. Then the Guru turned to another disciple by name Somanatha and said, Take this Nandi Sharma to the river for a bath, guide him in worshipping the nearby papal tree and then bring him back. Accordingly, Nandi Sharma finished the bath and worship at the Sangama, returned to the master and prostrated on his feet. The Lord lovingly raised him up and said, My son, Nandi Sharma, stand up and look at your own body. Nandi Sharma was amazed to find that all his body was clean except for a small ugly patch on the leg. He turned out to Sri Guru and asked him why the patch was left behind. Sri Guru said, You had a trace of doubt in your doubt, in your heart, and hence this patch has remained. Nandi Sharma bowed to him and prayed earnestly. Oh, Supreme Lord, is it possible that a man should drink ambrosia and yet simply because he mistakes it to be water, that he could be subject to death? Does the fire cease to burn simply because a man touches it and it grows? See, Nursima Saraswati said, Everything happens according to one's faith. If a man loses his sight through his own fault, can he see the sun? At first you had the doubt that nothing can be gained through the service of a guru. This patch is a consequence of it. Still, there is a means of getting rid of it. You sing a hymn of praise which on the basis of the teachings of the Vedas expresses your realization that I am not a mere mortal. Thereby you shall realize your object. The Brahmin felt helpless and trembled with apprehension and said, O Lord Supreme, you are the indweller of the hearts of all creatures. What need I to tell you? How can I compose a hymn when I am totally illiterate? Tell me something else which is in my power to do. Sri Guru said, My son, just as the tusk which has grown out of an elephant's mouth cannot be withdrawn to its root, the words I have uttered cannot be taken back. You must do as you are told. At once, great learning and poetic ability welled up in Nandi Sharma's heart. Love and reference for the Guru had cloyed his heart, and he commenced singing this hymn in a trembling voice. O oh, Supreme Lord, thou art that reality, you are the door, sustainer, the eternal witness, the true self of all. You have projected all creatures from three modes of prakriti and thereby projected the whole universe of things, moving, both the moving and unmoving. Among all the sentient creatures, only a human being is fit for enlightenment. Even he is deluded by thy power of maya. He is amidst in the web of motives and in the consequence of his sins wanders about the amidst, of, amidst the horrors of hell. And he cannot free himself in the course of the vast cosmic epochs, even if his soul passes to the higher realms of existence by the force of his virtuous deeds, as soon as their effects are worked out, he falls back to the realm of the moon. There he feeds himself of food and takes the form of sperm. At the time of conjugal union of this prospect to parents, he merges with the oval secretion of the mother-to-be and settles down in her womb. There he stays for a day in the form of a thick fluid and for the next five days he assumes the form of a bubble. After 18 more days he assumes a more solid form. In a month's time he grows more solid. In the course of months he develops the various parts of the physical body such as head in the first month, neck in the third, skin, nails and hair in the fourth. From the fifth month onwards the orifices like nostrils, ears and mouth appear. Movement starts in the 7th, in the 8th month, intellect starts manifesting itself. Thus, by the ninth month, his body is fully formed and he takes birth. Then he grows and dies and thus passes on from womb to womb endlessly. I have passed through all this gamut of experiences. In this life, I am illiterate, old, deceased and was in despair. O oh Lord, may you uplift me. I shall ever worship you henceforth. O oh Lord, owing to the pulsations of the womb, the human being emanates from it and at once loses his understanding and is deluded. 
during this infancy he has no freedom nor can he communicate his agony to others he loses sight of the very idea of winning his way to higher states of spiritual existence during his boyhood he forgets himself to in play and in youth he is totally preoccupied with sexual drives blind to all good and bad he is engulfed in a hectic pursuit of sensual pleasures like a beast in old age he will be obsessed with the fear of approaching death he is overtaken by illness like cough and breathing troubles finally he dies without gaining any mastery over his senses in this way a clear half of the whole span of man's life is spent away idly in night and night and sleep major portions of what is left are wasted in play during boyhood and early occupations in middle age in old age is not free but is dependent on others thus the precious human life is wasted away human life proves worthwhile only through devotion to you and through association with the wise and the devout therefore may you bless me with my faith in you and worthy association all my life then nandi sharma turned to the people who gathered there and said oh my brothers and sisters shri guru who is right in front of us is the supreme lord himself and not a common mortal as he looks those of you who wish to gain your welfare would do well to take refuge in him either through the practice of yoga or through listening to and meditating on his teachings the lord ever abides by those who are thus devoted to him for he he can be won over only through faith the brahmin turned again turned to the guru exclaiming o oh, thou supreme lord even the vedas have failed to describe thy glory indeed no one can enumerate thy glories which are infinite and are above this power of speech and mind to comprehend when he finally bowed down in reverence he found that even the little patchy of dirty skin on his body had been cleared then at the instruction of the guru he came away to gangapur along with his wife lived there for long and recorded the divine acts of shri guru one day nandi sharma read out his verses to another poet named narakeshari living in a nearby village the latter was an ardent devotee of lord shiva and he believed that the gods alone are worthy of adoration and worship It was his vow to compose a verse in praise of Lord Kaleshwara as the Lord Shiva was called in the local temple every day so he appreciated the poetry of Nandi Sharma's verses but objected to the glorification of a common mortal like Sri Narasimha Saraswati later in the day during his daily worship of Lord Kaleshwara when he was meditating on the linga Sri Guru appeared in that form laughed and taunted him saying where is your Lord Kaleshwara So he quickly concluded his meditation rest for darshan of the lord at Gangapur There as he began to sing the five verses he had composed in his praise Shri Guru said to him Why do you set aside the supreme lord and glorify a common mortal Amazed Narakesari said replied Lord I have indeed mistaken you for a common mortal may you shower your mercy on me dispel, dispel my ignorance and grant me true wisdom My delusion is now dispelled and the merit of all my previous acts of austerity has borne fruit in this moment may you accept me as your disciple and bless me Shri Guru was pleased with the devotion of the visitor gave him a comment and said you continue to worship Lord Kaleshwara at your place for myself I am here there in that form Narakya Shri submitted my lord I am not to forego your immediate presence bless me with the good fortune of serving you without much difficulty i have gained you who are the divine wish fulfilling wish fulfilling cow wish fulfilling cow the kamadenu i am the humblest of your disciples may you not be indifferent to my plea the merciful lord then accepted him as his disciple and bestowed him on him the bliss of self realization Thus Narakeshari also served the master for long by singing his glory in his poems.